Welcome to the PEHP webinar. I'm Linda Blades, Wellness Manager, and with me today is Michelle Allard, Health Coach. We're well into 2020, and I'm sure that you've had a chance to reflect on experiences of the past year or decade, and are looking forward to the new experiences in the coming year. Today, this presentation is a reflection of the past century. We'll look back at some of the major milestones, trends, and significant scientific findings in exercise, physical activity, and fitness that will hopefully help propel you forward with your own personal goals for the upcoming year. There are many cultural, cultural factors that influence trends in physical activity and fitness throughout the ages. We'll explore how these fitness and exercise trends have evolved and take a look back at the movers and the shakers the iconic figures who led the fitness movement and were the influencers of their own time. Fitness, fashion, entertainment, media, politics, science, technology are all themes that have been interwoven into fitness culture in America over the past century. We'll look at many of these things and then identify practical ideas we can take home that will benefit us as we move forward with our own personal fitness journey. So let's all hop into the DeLorean and go back in time. So buckle your seatbelt as we get a glimpse of how exercise and fitness played a part in our country's culture, exploring decade by decade how some of the trends and developments brought us here to the year 2020. Physical activity prior to 1920 was often undertaken for purposes of achieving a higher spiritual goal. In fact, there was a muscular Christianity movement. However, at the beginning of the 1920s, the pursuit of fitness took a more individualized and self-centered turn. The idea emerged that peak physical fitness would be a way for a person to advance in life and search for one's own uniqueness. During this period, we saw the rise of the gymnasium, but there was nothing fancy or spa-like about these early gyms. Interesting equipment like this fat-burning machine popped up in gyms in the 30s. The 20s marked the beginning of motion pictures and was an age where image and presentation of oneself became an art. Messages surfaced about how physical activity could improve chances of success in life by finding ideal employment, attracting a partner, and enjoying life to the fullest. The motivation to become fit was mainly about achieving an attractive appearance. Charles Atlas was one of the first fitness enthusiasts, and he was well known for bringing attention to the term bodybuilding. He and other fitness entrepreneurs of this time, like Bernard McFadden and Jack LaLanne, were recognized as early leaders of the fitness movement. In 1935, Bernard McFadden created a fitness publishing empire with 35 million readers. He recommended a minimalist lifestyle based on time spent in nature, daily vigorous exercise, and elimination of alcohol, tea, coffee, and white bread from one's diet. McFadden founded one of the first muscle magazines called Physical Culture, as seen here, and staged the first physique contest in the States in 1903. He is considered one of the precursors of the health and fitness industry as we know it today. Sports were an inextricable part of men's fitness, and this is when Walter Camp came on the scene. He was considered the father of American football, taking the game of rugby and organizing it into the football sport that we know today. He also wrote the no novel Keeping Fit All the Way, which focused on health, strength, and efficiency. His fitness approach includes exercises such as squats, various forms of planks, and the forward bend. By this point in time, physical fitness was a shared value in America, and most states had passed legislation that required physical education in public schools. PE classes had a strong emphasis on sports skill development. Although women were not encouraged to sweat in public in this era, they were more and more commonly becoming engaged in their own fitness regimes at gyms and by using home exercise equipment. Stationary bikes and treadmills had already been around for a while and were being used by both men and women, and women began using barbells for building strength. Gymnastics rose in popularity and the sport became a women's Olympic event for the first time in 1936. Reducing was the focus of women's fitness in the 20s, and this persisted through the 1950s and 60s. Americans placed a value on fitness from before World War II throughout the war and beyond. In fact, the need for fit soldiers brought a new focus on exercise. Although many gyms and clubs closed during the war, 
fitness culture endured trying times. In 1953, researchers conducted a battery of fitness tests on children aged 6 to 19 in the United States, Austria, and Italy, measuring both strength and flexibility. Results were astonishing and surprising and revealed that America's youth were not as vigorous and fit as the country had thought. The study showed major differences between the European and American children. Only 8% of European children failed the test, while 56% of American children failed. The researchers attributed the differences to the fact that European children do not have the benefit of a highly mechanized society with no cars, school buses, elevators, or any other labor-saving devices, and Europeans walked everywhere. It was a time when less physical movement was required at work, and TV began to occupy leisure hours. President Eisenhower addressed the finding that American children were weaker than their European counterparts by instituting the President's Council on Youth Fitness in the 1950s, thus beginning a national conversation about fitness. A presidential public information and media campaign was also launched and raised awareness of total fitness and sent the message that parents and youth had a civic duty to get in shape. One of the organizers of the council stated, anything we can do to direct the activities and energies of young America is a measure of national defense. Less physical movement was required at work and there was a greater dependence on vehicles. Then the cardiac crisis of the 1950s struck and there was a spike in heart attacks in men. This sparked an interest in exercising for health and a particular interest in reducing risk of heart attack. Not getting enough physical activity was thought of as a problem for the privileged, and exercise time was a leisure activity of the elite. Scholars in exercise science emerged and scientific societies were established, including the American College of Sports Medicine, which in 1954 issued recommendations for exercise and health. Throughout the 1940s and 50s, we saw the commercialization of fitness and entrepreneurs look for ways to make a buck from fitness enthusiasts by building exercise and fitness related businesses. Following on the same path, the nutrition supplement business took off and fitness magazines and books became widely available. Along with the growth of the fitness industry came an increase in false claims that certain fitness products can provide a quick fix or surefire fitness solution. Strange new bodybuilding machines, slenderizing gadgets, reducing salons, and products popped up. Advertises the way to achieve the desired slender and fit physique. Television brought a new source of information on health and fitness, and with it came exercise shows. It was common for women to gather in each other's homes to exercise together in front of the TV. Here's a photo with an example of what one of the reducing salons looked like, along with an ad for Slenderella, another reducing salon. One of the first fitness experts to have a TV show was Jack LaLanne, who was one of the early leaders in the movement. What makes Jack unique is his staying, staying power. He was engaged in the fitness movement throughout World War II and continued his show through the mid-1980s. His was the longest running exercise television program of all time. Referred to as the godfather of fitness and the first fitness superhero, besides his TV show, Jack published several books on fitness and in 1936 opened one of the nation's first fitness gyms in Oakland, California and invented dozens of machines that filled the gym. He accomplished major fitness feats. At age 42, he set the world record for doing over 1,000 push-ups in 23 minutes. He was in such incredible shape that he could do one-armed fingertip push-ups. And at, at age 60, he swam from Alcatraz to Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco while wearing handcuffs and towing a 1,000-pound boat. To celebrate his 70th birthday, he swam one and a half miles while wearing handcuffs and shackles on arms and legs towing 70 rowboats holding 70 people. In the 60s, gyms became more luxurious and spa-like, and reducing and slimming trend was still popular for women. Exercise was seen as a beauty treatment, and women were still doing just about anything to lose inches, as you can see from this photo here. In 1961, President Kennedy reformed the President's Council on Youth Fitness that President Eisenhower initiated, and it became the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. Presidential Physical Fitness Awards began under the direction of President Johnson in 1966. 
Many of you out there listening will remember the flexed arm hang, pull-ups, and the sit and reach. Technology of biomechanics and full range of motion in weight training became common, especially with the invention of the Nautilus brand exercise equipment. The Nike brand was launched in 1972 and made us believe that we could jump higher and run faster with the right fitness shoe. And in 1968, Dr. Kenneth Cooper wrote a book called Aerobics, which explained the cardiovascular training effect in layman's terms and helped translate the science of exercise into practical use. His research and publications refined what most Americans embrace as the factors that constitute fitness. This brought attention to all the health benefits of physical activity and launched the jogging and aerobic dance trends. Up until this time, it was very rare that you would ever see a person out running or jogging in the streets unless they were being chased. Runners talked about the feeling of well-being and a runner's high that came with this form of activity. He says, there are six components of wellness, proper weight and diet, proper exercise, breaking the smoking habit, control of alcohol, stress management, and periodic exams. Like Jack LaLanne, Debbie Drake became one of the first fitness gurus. A female trailblazer in the 60s, she starred in her own women's daily exercise show on TV, which was on dozens of stations around the country. In 1961, she published the book Easy Way to a Perfect Figure and Glowing Health. She gave readers advice on everything from slimming your thighs to exercising your hair and cheek reducing. She said, if your cheeks are too full, practice this regime to suck away fatty tissue that puffs out a fat cheek. Originally from Austria, Arnold Schwarzenegger began lifting weights at age 15 and won the Mr. Universe title in 1967. His achievements in fitness helped him get noticed and transition into work as an actor and politician. On-site fitness facilities and nutrition education at workplaces became more common. By 1980, 3,000 businesses offered health and fitness programs for employees, and this trend has continued to grow up until today. The word craze could adequately describe the fervor in the 80s when the fitness move movement kicked into high gear. This was the rise of the health club and aerobics classes, which opened up social opportunities for friendship and community. In 1980, the New York Times declared that this is the year to show your muscle. How can we talk about the 80s without mentioning fitness fashion? Things got a little bit crazy. Leg warmers, leotards, and Reebok high tops were the iconic look of the decade. Fitness enthusiasts bought into Nike's Just Do It slogan, and were willing to pay good money to have just the right look at the gym. In 1984, it was reported that Americans spent $500 million on fitness apparel alone. In the 90s, we also saw the rise of home fitness products like the Gazelle and the Health Rider and infomercials on TV pushing these items, not to mention the myriad of fitness videotapes available now that the VHS player was a common household item. There was an increased number of treadmills and homes in fitness magazines like Muscle and Fitness and Shape had gained popularity. Jazzercise grew in popularity as well throughout the 80s. Judy Shepard Bissett started Jazzercise classes in 1969 and she still runs the company and teaches today. Other types of aerobic dance classes were inspired by Jazzercise as well. During this time period, we also saw shows like Hook on, Hooked on Aerobics, which was created by Brigham Young University PE professor Phyllis Jacobson. The show was created locally and broadcast nationally and was unique because it showed dance moves with low, medium, and high effort, which provided a customized workout for any fitness level. Actress Jane Fonda also spearheaded the craze by opening a workout studio in LA and then launched a very successful series of aerobic exercise videos, which sold over 17 million copies and became the best-selling home exercise video of all time. Richard Simmons was one of the biggest icons of the time. He grew up struggling with his weight and began his fitness career by opening a gym in Beverly Hills, California. Known for his eccentric personality, he created the Sweat into the Oldies videos and influenced fitness followers all over the span of several decades. 
Despite the buzz about health clubs, muscles, and aerobics in the 80s, the U.S. Public Health Service estimated that 80 to 90 percent of all Americans were not engaging in sufficient physical activity. Perhaps the idea of fitness was more popular than the actual practice of exercise. By the end of the 90s, we were fatigued. Our bodies were aching and we needed a rest from, high impact aerobic, from the high impact aerobics age. Gentler and kinder forms of exercise like yoga and Pilates were being revitalized and moderate movement was becoming more widely accepted. Exercise and physical activity took on distinct meetings to suggest that health benefits can still be gained through moderate exercise. In 2008, the Department of Health and Human Services issued the physical activity guidelines for Americans with age-specific targets for activity. They stated preschool kids should be active throughout the day. Children and adolescents aged 6 to 17 should get 60 minutes of activity a day or more. And adults should engage in at least 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous aerobic physical activity weekly, along with strengthening on two or more days of the week. Older adults are encouraged to perform the same activities as well, but to also incorporate balanced exercises on a regular basis. The mental health benefits of exercise became better understood as well, motivating many to to get moving to improve mood and beat feelings of depression and anxiety. We discovered new fun ways of staying active through gaming with Just Dance, the Wii Fit, GPS tracking technology, heart rate monitors, and pedometers. And the Fitbit was invented in 2007. Dancing for exercise was embraced with the popularity of Dancing with the Stars and Zumba. YouTube exercise videos made it easier than ever to try new forms of activity in the privacy of your own living room. Equipment like kettlebells, BOSU balls, and TRX suspension training kept fitness regimes interesting and there was an increased emphasis on core function and body weight training. CrossFit gyms were also popping up with cult-like popularity. The internet and social media provided even more outlets for fitness instruction and information. The downside is that many unqualified and self-proclaimed fitness experts were in a position to disperse inaccurate and potentially harmful information. It also left questions in followers' minds about what is real and what's fake and what is healthy and attainable versus what is unrealistic when it comes to getting in shape. Bob Harper was considered a fitness icon of this time even though he was never involved in sports in high school. As an adult, he became a fitness instructor and worked with many celebrities. He was best known for his role on The Biggest Loser with Jillian Michaels. Denise Austin is also a fitness guru who has made a life out of motivating people to get moving. She has sold more than 20 million exercise videos and has written 10 books. She is a big believer in a well-balanced workout plan, which means cardio, strength training, and flexibility. She has a moderate approach to fitness and tells people, it isn't about being a skinny mini, it is about being fit and healthy. It's about how you live your life and how you are balanced. So what have we learned? Here we are. The DeLorean has brought us back to present time, so let's reflect on what we've learned over the past few decades. Despite all the advancements in new information as we Americans have room to improve when it comes to our health status. Reasons for less than ideal health and fitness may be due to a combination of things our culture, the environments we live in, time, and the personal choices we make. One thing that is consistent over time is that there is always misinformation in people who are trying to make a quick dollar on those who feel desperate to get fit. There was no real quick fix in 1920, and there is no quick fix in 2020. Specialty equipment by itself is not going to get us in shape. And of course, the benefits that come from being physically fit are the same across the ages. You'll feel better, look better, have greater strength and endurance, and an improved attitude and disposition. So what do you really need to stay physically fit? Your own body with a little help from gravity, room to move in your living room or the great outdoors, dedication, and doing something that you enjoy. No thigh master or shake weight is needed. Over the century, reasons to stay fit have evolved and over the course of one's lifetime. 
The motivation will change, but there must always be a reason, a personal why, no matter what area you live in or stage of life you're at. It has always taken and will always take energy, effort, and consistency to maintain good health in a fit body. Well, thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.